Well, welcome to North House Folk School in Grand Marais, Minnesota. Uh, my name is Todd Hawkinson, and I teach the uh, casting class here probably oh, on a good year several times. And we cast sterling silver. The, the class uh, has an ounce of sterling for everyone to, to make jewelry with. And I'm going to do the whole class for you today to be able to have you watch what you'd come and take. We have some tools that I bring, and I'm, I'm set up with a little factory actually for, for what we need. And everybody has, in essence, the same set of tools to be able to start on a ring. And then ultimately, I think people usually make uh, maybe one or two rings in a pendant. And uh, we know how much we can do because of the, the weight factor. But we're looking at about an ounce of sterling and then how that works. So um, just if you want to pan um, the, the setup here, just to take a look at what we've got. Of course, I've got a little workstation. And uh, this, this machine here is the spin casting machine. So this is a real standard machine for making jewelry and, and lost wax centrifugal casting is the technical term and uh, the molten metal actually spins into the machine and into a, a flask that we're going to actually demonstrate today. We've got a polishing station, we also have, um, it's like a welding setup, it's, it's oxygen and propane, not oxygen and acetylene, I, I don't care for that. And then this is the new kit on the block. When we're mixing up our plaster, it's nice to get all the bubbles out of the plaster. So I made this thing. I mean, it's just a little vacuum table, and it works fine. So I'll show you how that works also during this process. And so, uh, oh, if you come up for the class, the first session is a Friday session from about 4 until 8 o'clock. And that's me doing the whole class. I want everybody to see the casting process and watch me demonstrate casting three times before you do it yourself. So Friday, I demonstrate the casting process. Saturday morning, when everybody comes in and we start, I second uh, the second demonstration of the casting process. And then everybody gets their, their jewelry ready Saturday, and they pour plaster Saturday before we're done. This process involves pouring the plaster into a cylinder, and this has to actually fire in an oven or a kiln overnight. So Saturday night, these go in the oven, and it's fired just like a piece of ceramic. And so the ceramic will come out hot, and that's what's spun, it's, uh, the molten metal goes in there. So it's real interesting. Again, I wanna make sure everybody knows what they're doing um, and sees what they're doing before they do it themselves. And so far, everybody that has taken the class has cast successfully. I mean, some of the little, when we do it, if you haven't seen it before, it's a little intimidating because we've got a lot of molten metal flying around here, but it, it's, it's all doable. I try to be very consistent and very safe. Again, if you notice the mask here, we are being more prepared at North House. I'm not going to do the uh, cast like this because it's just verbally, I think it'd be tough. But if we have a class, most likely we'll be concerned about this and safety and distance education is also a priority here at North House. Uh, the, the classrooms that we have will have, I'm sure, six feet to work on. And I will have to be closer for the casting process, but I don't think that's a problem. We'll do it on a one-to-one -one basis, and, and we'll certainly take precautions about that. And that's a safety factor. I want to be right next to you when we're casting. So if we start at the beginning, the, the first part of the class is me making something. I think um, what I typically start off in is I make a ring, because that's what's, what's put in the catalog. Is what are you going to do? Well, it, making a ring is kind of cool, and it's a sterling silver ring. So that's the other part that's also really neat. And it starts off with a, a, a chunk of plastic, which is kind of a wax, and this I cut up. So it's just cut up like a, like a loaf of bread. And so I'll cut a piece off, and we'll give everybody plenty of this stuff so that if, in case you make a mistake or if it breaks, we can you know, keep going. And then the various tools that are used for this are kind of like woodworking tools. It's not uh, like you have to have a real special, special set of wax tools, although there's some special tools. I just use inexpensive files and uh, Oh gosh, like a coping saw, saw blade. These are just a saw blade that you can get at Menards and then mount into a, either a coping saw frame or a jeweler saw. And then there are different tools that we also use for measuring. The divider is a good tool. I have, I've fallen in love with some of these digital tools. A digital caliper is also great for measuring uh, the different lengths and you know having a, a common width of a product or a ring that you work on. So we share all these tools and if you have uh, the need or the want to be able to do more. I've got a tool list that I give also for the class and as well as where to get the stuff. So with this one, um, I've been kind of starting this one and this is the one tool that is specific for this, but it's a tool that will make the ring larger. It's like a little uh, well, kind of a scraper reamer 
And as you tool this thing up, you're removing the wax slash plastic on the inside. And again, it's got a taper to it, so you want to make sure you do it on both sides until this thing is going to fit. And so I did this one for my finger. Now that's a little bit big for you know a ring just to be cast, but it's it's whittling. You're taking and just chipping away and carving this into whatever you want. It's really a, a great material. This uh, this plastic, oh gosh, comes from various tools, but it's a a, a, a matte product. Um, and it's available just about everywhere. In fact, I know the guy that, it, that uh, he's still with us now. His name is Adolfo Matiello. And Adolfo is a Spanish guy from Argentina. So that's interesting that, how that went. But he went from Spain to Argentina to New York. And again, if he's still with us, this is his company. And there's a lot of matte tools and matte products that he's worked on for this process. Anyway, I, like, I prefer to use the... Um, the purple colored wax and what we're going to do is we're going to, and I've got one that's a little bit more finished, we're going to get this purple ring mounted on a sprue base and in fact I've, I've, I've pre-carved a, a ring and then on the bottom of the ring you have to have a wax like a feed line that's called a sprue. So this particular ring is going to go right on there and I melt it on there and so it's going to be mounted and then the cylinder will go on top of that, plaster will be poured on top of that, and then again this thing goes in the oven. So it's going to be a real process of 15-20 well, steps. I also, because we've got an ounce of silver to work with, I have to kind of know how much this weighs so I can determine how much silver to use. And so between weighing it right now and weighing it on the base and subtracting the base, I can get a pretty good idea of how much sterling silver I'm going to need. And then I'm going to need a little bit extra tool. You can't just cast the exact same amount. You, you've got to cast with a little bit extra. So I'm taking you know, um, a wax spatula, it's called a, a hot wax knife or whatever. And it's kind of like a little wood burning tool that's on a rheostat. And I try to make sure that the base is clean. So that's scrubbed out pretty well. And then I also want to make sure that it's fairly smooth. And I, the way I describe this process is that it's like a funnel. And we want to be able to make sure that the funnel has got a smooth connection. And there isn't a, a, a pinch in the funnel. I mean, another uh, way I like to describe this is if you had a straw and you attached a straw to something that you wanted to have material flow through, you'd have to taper that connection. And if you have a pinch straw, it would impede some of the flow. So this is going to be in the middle, and I'm just going to secure the edge with a little bit of wax so it's just got a, got a slight funnel shape to it. And I also did some other work um, yesterday. I'm here for four days. I do some other pieces for production, and so these are actually wax patterns that I'm going to do for uh, casting some of the Scandinavian pieces I make. And the idea here is I want to be real efficient with my, with my work and I can cast as many as I can fit on the base. As long as they don't touch another, each other and as long as they don't touch the base, we're good to go. And I don't need more than one. You typically don't need one, more than one sprue. It just, uh, it's, it's overkill. The, the people that have multiple sprues are coming from the foundry world. And the foundry world needs to have these extra wires so that the air can flow out as the metal goes in. But with the spin casting and triple casting, the force is not going to require the extra um, wires. Just one. For the most part, I put a bigger one on the ring. It's, the, it's a bigger item. But all the pendants have got a similar size sprue. And again, you really only need one. So with these two, if I want to be able to determine what metal I need, I've got a little scale, a digital scale, and we're going to zero it out and weigh this. And we also use a, kind of a unique bunch of words in our jewelry business. And one of the words is a penny weight. And a penny weight, I believe, originally is a German term, but it's 20 parts of an ounce. So in the jewelry world, 
if I'm looking at 20 penny weights, I'm looking at an ounce of material. So I've got 25.9 penny weights. I'm going to subtract the base. Let's do this because I'm, I'm lousy at ma mental math. Let me try it again here. 25.9 minus the base, which is 23.7, is 2.2. .2. So I'm going to need 2.2 .2 times about 10. I'm going to need 22 penny weights to cast this flask. And I'll cast this one tomorrow here. And I'll add, add more. I'll probably add another 10 penny weights to have this reservoir fill up. So this is going to be an ounce and a half of sterling silver for tomorrow's cast. The ring, same thing. On this one, we have 38.4 minus the base. The base is 36.8 and times 10 again. So this one is going to be 16 penny weights, which is 16 twentieths of an ounce. Okay, so I'm still going to have to have probably an ounce of material to cast this one ring all by itself. So that's a pretty good sized ring. At this point, I like to know which flask is which, and so these cylinders go on and they snug up. And these are also like a stainless steel cylinder. They last a long time. I used to use uh, electrician's pipe. You know, that you use conduit, but that stuff would just rust and it wouldn't give me any type of life. I'm sure these flasks are 15 years old. And I also want to know what the material and everything is going to be around. So I'm going to put this around each top. And for our class, I put your name on there. Now it makes sense to, if I have eight of these in the oven that you are going to cast your own flask. So. This one was the 22, so this is going to be 30 penny weights. And I know it's sterling. And these are two different size items. If you look at the, the heft of the ring versus the thinness of the pendants, these are cast at different temperatures. And they come out of the oven hot, but they're lowered to a plateau of temperature that will work for the product. Uh, the, one of the examples I, I teach in the class is the difference between casting a belt buckle and casting a filigree piece of jewelry. You can't cast them at the same temperature. They're, they're, they're just not going to work. Something's not going to work. Let's say they put the belt buckle on the same base as a filigree ring and try to cast them. One of those is going to be crap. So in any event, we're going to pour plaster on these two pretty much right now. So we'll go through the casting process, but the, the first part is to be able to determine what we're going to be casting. And this is, again, about an ounce and a half of sterling silver for the pendants and about an ounce of sterling for the ring. And that'll be tomorrow. So I'm doing a demo tomorrow about two, so these two will be cast tomorrow. The ones I set up for today were basically the same type of thing we have, which is small pendants. So um, I'm going to leave these here. But now we're going to swing over here and talk about the investment part. <laughs> The investment part is a matter of mixing water and a special plaster. It's not plaster of Paris, but it's a, a casting investment. And there's different ingredients in this stuff that work for casting jewelry. And I think the, the foundry people have got different materials that they use, and there's lots of different types of plaster that you can use. But the most common is used, I think, for sterling and gold. And oh gosh, you can buy it in 10 pounds, 25 pounds, 50 pounds, 100 pounds. It's just a matter of having the right, right stuff around. So I've got a pound and a half of the investment and then a corresponding amount of water. And this is not just guessing, this is all weighed. I don't believe in, in guessing if at all possible because for uh, success and a good product, we have to be consistent. So this is not a guess. I am gonna mix it up. I've got a little mixer here. I've got uh, a spatula that is gonna you know, help it come together. But I wanna be able to point out there's three different little stages of this process. The first third of it, and it's roughly a, a, about approximately nine minutes that we're going to be you know, maxing this out at, is going to be just the manually mixing. And that's between manual spatula and mixing it with the, the whisk egg beater. So we know that the, the material is really, really well mixed. Kind of like mixing up cake batter, I suppose, cake boom, from the box. Then it goes into the vacuum bell jar, and because we've just mixed it up like crazy, there's lots of bubbles in there. This is going to be a debubbling 
process where this is going to rise and fall and just sit there and, and it looks like it's boiling. It's not actually boiling, but we're, we're decreasing the, the, uh, the air in there, which will help a cleaner casting and a cleaner pour for the investment. Then after it's been in the second part of the process, which is the, the vacuuming, I'm going to take this and pour on, onto these and re-vacuum these. So bubbles are the bad guy. If you want to have bubbles on your casting, that's not the idea of having a good casting. So mask on for safety. This has got a silica in it, so you know, no matter what, you've got to vent this or have a mask on. I've got both a, a, a mask and a vent at my shop. But this is just something to be real careful with. So roughly again, about, about oh, at the most six to nine minutes. And so this will pour in. And I usually just stir it until the powder is gone and then I'll move to the machine. And everybody has their own opinion about what to do with this, but I prefer to use the formula that they give you so that I'm not just guessing and I'm able to make sure that I'm fairly consistent every time I do this. inside the bell jar and then we seal the unit and watch the gauge. It has to get up to almost 28 pounds or inches of mercury, I'm not sure you know, what the term is, to have this work. And what happens on the inside is that as the air is coming out, this will rise and fall. So this is one of the safety checks that I like to be able to tell people about is this investment is going to rise and fall. And then that's a good barometer that things are going okay. But there is rising right now and falling. So everything is going well so far. That's my, one of my safety checks or my consistency checks. And now we're in the second part of this process of just letting it sit there. You have at the most 10 or 12 minutes to work with, but typically a small batch you don't necessarily have to bring it that long a timeline. So we've got these all set now. They're labeled. I've even got springs on this thing so I can make it jump a little bit. Okay, now we're going to break the vacuum. Over the waxes. And this can be thrown out 
poured into the trash, not into the sink because it might harden, but it could just be poured and thrown out right now. Any extra is fine. And now we go through the last part, which is, again, a revacuuming. And what's going to happen now, it's not going to rise and fall, it's just going to bubble. And so the bubbling will minimize any little bubbles that might attach themselves to the wax and give you, a, you know, a, not a bad casting, but it's a lot more work to clean off those little bubbles. So now we're in the last third section of this process, and so far everything looks really good. I've done as many as 10 or 15 of these in one batch, which means you really got to move because you're mixing up 10 pounds of investment, you're vacuuming it, you're pouring it, and you still have to have the same three cycles, the three steps in the cycle to have it work. So this process is kind of towards the, the last part of the, the day that everybody works. We're getting most of this done on a Saturday. And roughly three or four o'clock, we start to pour plaster. So well, there'll be a, a little bit of a, a cycle going on. You can, you can pull the plug on that. If you want. And now these are just gonna sit. Now in the dental industry, dental industry is probably really involved in casting uh, uh, gold teeth. That was probably how the jewelers got into casting. So the, the dentists did the gold tooth casting first. And nowadays the, the, the dental investment doesn't even need the cylinder. You don't need these things. They just do it in a paper cup. And the whole cylinder then is cast. And I've tried that stuff. I'm not real comfortable with it. But the, the dental industry has got more technology and more R&D, I think, than the jewelry industry. I always tell people that the jewelers will look over a, a, a dental technician's shoulder all the time and, and copy something and learn something. But these are going to sit. Now these are going to go in the oven for the burnout process after a couple hours. They've got to sit for a couple hours before you throw them in the oven. They just have to stabilize. If you try to do it before that, you can have some, some problems because what's happening with this, it goes in and you have a, like a formula where you're putting something in heat. And by adding heat and having the water come out of it, you have a process that you have to kind of do in a slow fashion as opposed to try to doing it quickly. And that's also something in the instructions on the stuff. So these are just going to sit. I'll probably just get these out of the way. And now we can, we can travel into the, the casting area, the burnout oven. And this is just a little night craft. We have enough for eight flasks in there when we're teaching the class. If I had a big oven, I suppose I could have more flasks, but this works out pretty well. This is a great oven. I've had this thing for 15, 20 years, and it, it really is still a workhorse. And uh, the flasks are loaded up. They were loaded up yesterday, and they fire just like you fire a piece of ceramic. They're still so hot, they would give me a real nasty burn. So I, I've got to do everything with uh, a tong or a gripper to bring this to and from wherever I'm going. So the, the idea here is, again, keep in mind, we're, it's like we're firing a piece of ceramic. You've got clay that goes into a coffee mug, and then it's done. But this stuff is designed to be receptive to the molten metal, so it breathes. Because the wax that was, let me, let me show you, uh, a, a, let me show you this thing. Again, the wax was in this yesterday, and now we just have holes. That's where the wax was. And again, that's why it's called lost wax casting, because the, the, what you get is exactly what you had in the wax. So it's burnt out. It burns out at the peak temperature of almost 1,400 degrees Fahrenheit, and now I'm dropping it down to about 1,000 degrees for the items I'm casting. If I was going to cast a belt buckle, the belt buckle would be cast at maybe 600 degrees, 500 degrees, but not at the same temperature as the higher pieces. So I'm going to prep the, the machine now, the casting machine, and I've got to turn the, turn the fuel on. And again, it's just like a, a welding setup. 
and talk about the torch. This is probably the most one of the more important parts about casting is to know what to do with this thing. And I typically don't recommend casting with a little bitty torch because it's just too small. It's going to work too hard. And I don't use a, a jeweler's torch. I, I use one that's designed for, for more melting. And I also put a rosebud tip on it. So I've got a broader flame that will melt the metal in my melting machine. The metal is going to go into this part of the machine. And in fact, the residue that's on there is actually good because it acts as a magnet to any of the, the impurities that we might see in, a, in a, another melt. But again, torch. Torch is the first thing. I, I also like to talk about this from uh, using it for the first time. If I haven't used this, I used it yesterday, if I hadn't used it before, there would be atmosphere in these lines, and that's not going to work very well. I'm pretty sure right now I can just light it up, which I can. But if you have a tough time lighting a torch, it's probably because there's the air that we breathe in the line, and you have to open it up slowly so that the fuel and the oxygen will eventually get up there and do what they're supposed to do. So here's the key here, is I want to melt with the right flame. And so I'm going to slowly go back and forth and open the flame up. Until the oxygen is wide open. This is not the controlling factor. The other fuel is the controlling factor. So when I find the right flame, it's a matter of the adjustment on the fuel side. Now it's, 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 oh, oh, let's see. We've got a couple things we're looking for. We're going to try to find a too hot flame and then back it into the right temperature flame. So with the oxygen wide open, I'm going to get a hissy flame it's also too bright. That's too hot. And I can now, with the same control, find the middle flame, the neutral flame. And that's what I'm going to melt with. So, turn this off. This is all prepped. And we, everybody casts. And now we'll talk about the casting machine. This is a, a Lucas casting machine, which I think is the best in the world. And it spins counterclockwise. It has a free spin, and it, it's wound up clockwise. And so we want to be able to start with no spring tension, and I usually start counting with the weights away from me, and I'm going to wind it up twice, and there's a set pin down here that's going to lock this handle and keep this thing locked, and so it'll be ready to, to spin when I'm casting. So I'm going to go around once, and I'm going to go around a second time, and I'll help you with this, and the pin drops, and now this thing is wound up. And when I release, when I let this lever go up, the whole thing spins. The other ones, which is like this machine, I got a spare here. The, this, the older unit just had a set pin. So you'd have to have your hand in here to be able to move the weights to drop the pin and then get your hand out of there for this thing to actually engage. I, I've always been uncomfortable with that. So it's safer and quicker, which I think is a really good combination for what we're doing. We're going to have. Uh, Everybody gets silver, and we make our own sterling silver in this class. So I've got a coin that's a, not a, uh, like a coin that you'd use for money. But it's a, in this particular size, it's an ounce and a half. And these little BB things are the alloy that we make sterling with. So talk a little bit about terms and about stuff. And if you know um, how sterling is marked, sterling is marked 925. That's a, that's a marking numerically for sterling silver. That means 925 parts out of 1,000 parts are pure silver. And in the past, it's always been copper. So we're using a non-tarnishing alloy that will minimize the tarnish on this casting. And I just love it. It's still sterling silver, but it's not copper. So I've got my metal in the melting dish. It's all set to go. I'm going to probably preheat this a little bit before I get my flask out, because this having been not used today yet, is going to be stone cold. And so it's going to take me a little extra time to warm this up. So that'll also give me a little more time to be able to get this prepped for the, the, the flask coming in. So now I put the dark glasses on. And when we're casting in the class, 
Everybody's going to do this. So this is where I'm going to have to stand next to you. I'm not going to touch you. But I want to make sure that everybody does this the same. So back to seeing this for the second or third time. We're going to get this oxygen wide open. That's not the control. The other one, propane, is the control. We're going to get that hot hissing flame back to a neutral flame. So this is actually an oxidizing flame going to a neutral, neutral flame. Way too hot. Just right. Way too hot. Again. Just right. You can also just rest the uh, glass. Uh, I'm sorry. You can just rest the cord on a wash tub. The wash tub is going to be a flash guard for this process. This first melt, roughly takes about five minutes. And then the second melt and the third melt take less time because we're in essence, we're heating it up without having to heat up the melting point. Also, like a pinch of salt that's going to go on top of there that will help it flow together. And I'll try to explain this process also. This is primarily a frozen position. You don't do much with this hand at all. And it doesn't make any difference if you're left handed or right handed. This is a left handed operation. But after I take a pinch of the flux, I've got a stir stick where I'm actually going to stir the metal. I'm going to feel the fluidity of the metal. And if there's any impurities that are on there, I'm going to try to bring them to the back of this melting dish. So there's, again, three or four different things that happen at the same time. This is probably the trickiest part to really know what you're looking for. So, I'm going to stop now. I can leave this flame lit. And I'm going to go get the flask and put it in there and get it all snugged up. You, you can just sit here. Okay, so here I've got the flask all hot and ready to go. And I'm just looking it over to make sure it all looks good. And I usually give it a little tap in case there's something that might fall in there. And this goes into the cradle. And the, the melting dish is pushed up there. And now we melt again. And this time it's going to be for the casting process. Probably the one um, intimidating part of the class, because if you have not been, done this before, it's like holding a jet engine in your hand. But really, it's, it's a, just a, a frozen position. No matter what you do with this, it just stays right on the edge there and melts away. You're filling that whole area with the uh, uh, right neutral flame, roughly about 2,000 degrees or so. Okay, so I'm going to take a pinch of the flux, put that on there. And now while the flame is still on there, I'm mixing this up. I'm also feeling it's fluid. It's got to be all liquid. If there's anything that is an impurity, the flux is going to gather it to the side of the melting dish. And now we release the machine and spin. Probably as basic a casting setup as you're going to see is right here. This is the, um, I think I started with making this type of product almost 50 years ago. And uh, uh, the casting process is still not going away. The, the 3D CAD CAM stuff grows grows parts, but they're, they're growing a material that's not really wax-like. So the, the challenge that is in that uh, 3D growing material is that it doesn't burn out of the oven very well. There's an ash or some residue that's still left in there as opposed to like wax, which really just becomes vaporous. So, you don't want to touch the hot part.
and there's the flask. That should be a little more flat, but this is still fine. And this is going to sit for approximately 10 minutes, and then we're going to quench it. So I'll just put that on this brick here. But also, with making our own sterling, if you look at the color of that, that is a, that's non-tarnishing sterling really stays nice and silver colored. It doesn't have a, a gray or a blackish color like the traditional copper sterling does. And so that's going to be working out just fine too when we're ready to quench it. If it's not copper, what's the what are the other parts? They don't tell you, but I believe it's some type of a silica or a boron material. They, it's a proprietary ingredient. But there is um, sterlium and argentium. There's probably half a dozen different companies now that are making a non-tarnishing silver. And there are different silvers for working in different ways between fabricating and die striking and casting that have different natures. Like the, the, the workers that work with a lot of silver wire, their sterling wire might have a special alloy so they can wrap it and have it work real well. So it's the metallurgists have really been going crazy with different types of silver for us. And I prefer the anti-tarnish, which is called a deox, deox silver. So as this cools down, it's going to be stabilizing and the, uh, um, Oh gosh, the, the way I like to describe working with metal is talking about balloons. I know if, if we were all looking at metal under a microscope, it would be crystalline structure. But for, for simplification, think about metal as a bunch of balloons together, all round balloons. Now if you had a bar of this material and you turn it into a horseshoe shape, those not, wouldn't be balloons anymore. They would start to overlap. And they don't become balloons unless you heat them up and relax the molecules. And so the people that overwork the metal sometimes will actually break it. It's never going to relax until it's reheated. And that, that annealing process allows a silversmith to be able to make something that might crack if they don't you know, soften and relax the molecules. So when this comes out of the casting, those molecules are just right at about a 10 minute wait before we quench it. And you can also just let the stuff air cool. That doesn't really make too much difference. It's going to be the same. Um, it's going to work the same. And then from there, I've got a casting from yesterday here somewhere. This was the cast that we did yesterday. And again, more of my small pieces. I'm doing Celtic pieces as well as some settings. And this is how it's going to look coming out after it's quenched in water. And you can see we have extra material, extra silver. And we're going to clip off the little sprue attachment, the little wax wires. So you don't even see that, but it has to have a way to get into that. And again, you don't mean no. You do not need more than one wire. It's really not necessary. And you can reuse all that silver. Oh right? yeah, yeah. In fact, you can see a little bit of the flux that's there. This will all clean up when it's molten by putting that flux in there and stirring it. This is just a, a, a little process of melting. Any any foundry will also do the same type of thing. They'll put some flux in there to help it clean before they do a pour. So these two have solidified now. I'm still going to wait a couple hours before they go in the oven for tomorrow. And I think we could probably quench this one. Let's get some... Uh, let me just do it right here. Just a bucket of cold water. And I still don't want to hold on to anything. But this is still very hot. And we're just going to plunge it in there, and you don't want to you want to plunge it in deep enough so that you don't see any of the fumes coming off. That's another safety factor. This this powdered stuff can be like a, a oh the way I like to describe it is like coal miner's lung. If you don't protect yourself from the silica that's in there, you can get yourself quite ill over a period of time. So this goes in quite deeply. It's not going to be anything more than just a rumble. And then when it stops rumbling, it's done, and I'm going to go fishing. And here's what we got cast today. I did some ginkgo leaves, I did a couple of Thor's hammers, and I can get a, a brush here and scrub that out. But take a look at that for a quick second here. And what's happening now is this was going to dry off and get this, this old spent plaster off of there. But the castings 
at least my castings, if I'm doing this right, and our class castings come out nice and clean. Again, if this was the traditional sterling, these would be a gray, not necessarily black, but a real gray casting because of the copper. And the process now is just a matter of cleaning off this plaster and doing some polishing. So the polishing, we're going to do maybe just a little bit of that. But I can take and clip this off here. So there's one. I did two Thor's hammers and two ginkgo leaves. And these are just a little bit bigger than the pieces I cast yesterday. So if I'm grouping the pieces, if you look at the, the fineness of some of the small, I usually like to group a similar product together. All the way from, you know, this I would almost call like a filigree piece to again a belt buckle. And they're all cast at a sliding temperature all the way down to a 500 degrees or so. So the rush is on now with the class because by this time it's Sunday midday. If we all cast a, a flask, we're starting about oh, 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning. We're done casting by 11. The key now is to be able to polish the stuff up. And for eight people casting two or three pieces a, at a time, I'm very involved in this station right here, which is the grinding and polishing process. And this is, we're cheating a bit because a, a piece of jewelry that's that's cast and polished well would have different stations that you'd polish. You're not just, just take and polish everything really shiny. You have flat wheels that polish a flat section. You might have curved sections with a brushing process. And it's a start to finish, kind of like oh, taking on and doing bondo work with a car. You know, you're grinding and filing all the way up to a real rouge finish. Setup wise, uh, people always are thinking, well, you know, how much would it cost? I think a whole setup like this would be probably a couple thousand dollars. That's not outrageous for trying to do something where you're, you're almost self-employed. The hard part, I think, is, is marketing. <laughs> and I know lots of people that are better at marketing than I am. But this is a fun class to take. We, we typically, and we go um, Friday evening and then we're, when you're done on Sunday, you're done. If you're done at 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock, we're out the door. And this setup is here, oh, we're going to cast uh, twice in August at North House and once, I believe, in October. And hopefully this next season will allow us to cast earlier on in the summer. They were can The whole campus being closed this last spring because of COVID um, changed the whole schedule. So it's, it's a matter of getting back involved and being safe. I think we can teach the class safely. Uh, I may be adding some other classes too, but for right now the casting class is very successful and everybody leaves with some jewelry. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm hoping you enjoyed your little class lesson. This is, uh, I used to teach this class in four weeks and now I teach it in two and a half days. But uh, I guess at this particular point if there are some questions, I'm certainly open to uh, either answer some questions or give you some more comments. I think you've been explaining yourself so well that people understand. <laughs> well, it's, I, I, I think there are some of the lessons that are easier explained in practical ways, like the, the balloons. You know, the, the metallurgist would say the crystalline structure, and you know, who knows what a crystalline structure is. Another thing that I like to talk about is, is some of the problems of metal not being um, cast properly. And the best example I can use with that is, like if you had water, and now you took that water and you boiled it. And what have you got? You've got ice, you got got um, bubbles coming up through the water. Now if you could immediately solidify that and you have an ice cube with bubbles in it. And that's the chronic problem that many jewelers as well as metal workers have is what do you do with bubbles that solidify in something? That's not a strong joint, that's not a good connection. And for a piece of jewelry, if you had a piece of gold or silver that had bubbles in it, it would be difficult to work with. And uh, how do you get bubbles out of an ice cube? It, it's, again, it's something that's difficult. We can burnish, and nowadays the laser can actually laser some of those little bubbles, but the chronic problem that we have as jewelers are bubbles solidifying in anything. 
There are lots of little history lessons, and I'm also, uh, I like to be able to pass on some stories of my apprenticeship. And so that's, that's part of the, the bonus round of being in the class is to be able to hear some of these stories about um, the jewelers that I apprenticed under and what type of characters we all are. So, well, we've got a number of future students that are thankful and glad they could watch and one stuck in Canada that can't cross the border and a couple others that are looking forward to the class. Well, we'd welcome everybody here. North House is a beautiful area. Uh, um, got a great day today. Lake Superior is just incredible if you haven't been up here before. Uh, and certainly the, the whole town of Grand Marie is very receptive to visitors. Great little town. So uh, until we see each other in class or if I do this again sometime, I will say goodbye. Thank you, Todd.